So today we're going to talk about electricity generation. Uh, I have a very special guest. Uh, who are you? Hello, uh, yeah, my, my name is Miguel Trenkel and uh, I studied engineering at university. I'm a mechanical engineer, spent a few years in the uh, energy industry and now I've kind of gone off on my own tangent and uh, created a game called Megawatt. So it's kind of why I've, I've come to the studio. Yeah, and I think really what we're going to talk about today is about because you've had recent experience in the working as an engineer, um, mm -hmm. actually looking at, I suppose, the way that we supply electricity in sort of mainly a UK focus. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I've got some questions because a lot of stuff that I used to teach uh, was correct maybe 10, 15 years ago, but I think things have moved on. It's a fast changing uh, industry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think one example I did, I, I said, you know, fossil fuels, we've got coal, oil and gas, mm -hmm. uh, and they're the things that we burn in power stations to generate electricity, but that's not necessarily strictly true in the UK, is it? No, so oil forms a very small part of what we burn. Um, okay. It's very polluting, it's not very nice, it's expensive, and it's useful for lots of other things. So we kind of use oil to build a lot of our plastic drive products and we've come to realize that actually we shouldn't be burning it to make electricity, it's very inefficient. We should be using it for other, other things. So in the UK and Europe, it's barely used. It is used fairly, well, quite a lot in oil producing countries yeah. because they have a lot of it and it's a lot cheaper for them to, to use for electricity. So it makes sense. If we've got oil, it's better to, uh, I suppose you learn about this in chemistry, about the sort of fractional distillation and so on. That's it. And that oil is going to be more useful as petrol and diesel or in the plastics industry mm -hmm. rather than just burning it, which you can do with coal and gas. Mm -hmm. Which you can't really do all those things you do with oil. Yeah. So, so coal is it's definitely fossil fuel. There's a limited supply um, and it is very polluting. So uh, why are we still using it? Or are we still using it in the UK at the moment? Yeah, we still use it a lot, but, well, actually, no, the UK has got really good at, at not using it. Every year you'll see that it, it drops down. Mm -hmm. the, the graph of use is interesting. It's like a wave because yeah. during winter it comes back up again because uh, we, need, we use a lot more energy in winter and solar power doesn't really uh, work very well in winter, yeah. as, as you can imagine. Um, but every year that graph gets lower and lower and lower, and I believe it's supposed to be phased out by 2025. We'll see, so see what happens. Soon. There'll be people watching this in the future going, yeah, that's never happened. But, but I suppose yeah. even though it is polluting, different countries might deal with that in a different way. So there might be, I suppose, maybe some kind of regulation for power stations in the UK, which might be different to other parts of the world and, and other nations where mm -hmm. they're still burning coal. The problem with coal um, compared to gas is that when you burn it, you release lots of other pollutants as well as carbon dioxide. So gas is is it's actually not that bad because it burns very clearly, cle cleanly. So okay. gas is methane, so yeah. CH4, a very small molecule. When you burn it, it creates CO2 and very little else. Mm -hmm. um, whereas coal produces twice as much CO2 as gas per uh, energy produced. Okay. But it makes nitrous oxides, it makes sulfur oxides, it makes all sorts of things that cause pollution, acid rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually is the, the cause of deaths from coal are 99% air pollution. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's and it's something that you don't see. It's quite insidious. It's it's around us, but we don't know about it. Yeah. Um. And yeah, it's it kills a lot of people every year. But but the reason that we use gas is because it's quite quick to to kind of fire up the power station. Is it? Is that mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah, because it's a gas, it's a lot easier to turn off and on. Um, so we use it to support the grid. So electricity grid, you need to be balancing supply and demand all the time. Mm -hmm. Um. And so on a large scale, if yeah, on a, on a large scale, you need to say, right, well, actually, at five or six o'clock, when people get home from work, they're going to be turning on the kettles, they're going to be cooking, demand increases a lot. So that's when you turn on the gas plants, and they can turn on in a matter of minutes, and you can bring a lot of power onto the grid. So it's a bit like lighting a Bunsen burner is kind of immediate, you've got that immediate heat, whereas this one said you've got to light a coal fire. It's exactly. going to take you a while to actually get the coal lit mm -hmm. up, get it hot enough, and then and so on. So, yeah, it's so, really a good, good example. So I suppose they're quite old technologies, they've been around for a long time, they're well established, but there's a lot of new stuff that's coming out and it's being developed all the time. Um, actually, this, this game that you designed, uh, Megawatt, you, you talk about, well, you don't have any oil, do you? You've got, um, yeah. you've got things like gas, we've got uh, coal. Um, right, uh, biomass, that's something we burn still. So is that just basically having like a big wood fire? Pretty much. Um, biomass encompasses quite a lot of different sources, but the, the crux of it is is that it's uh, supposedly renewable in that you're, you're burning things that have recently grown and captured that carbon. So it's often wood, um, but it could be waste, for example. You could burn um, when you make beer or, or when okay. you make kind of products, you have a lot of uh, 
waste organic material, which you can send to a biomass plant and burn it and use it for energy. Um, in the UK, uh, are you familiar with Drax? Uh, yep, yeah, so Drax, um, for, the, for the watchers at home, where, where is it? So it's, a... it's in Yorkshire. Okay. Like, like North Yorkshire. Yeah. A lot, right along the, uh, actually no, I don't think it's the one on the, on the motorway, but... Um, it's yeah, up it's... north somewhere, from the deep, yeah. north, deep dark north. <laughs> so it was a giant, giant coal plant. I think it had six units burning coal, mm -hmm. and each unit is about a gigawatt, so it was yeah. a, a huge source of energy. And over the last decade or so, uh, most of those units have been converted to burn biomass instead. Okay. Um, so it's more renewable. However, one of the issues is that the biomass being burnt is wood chopped down in Canada and then shipped over to the UK. So there's a lot of contention about whether that's really like a good thing. Yeah, so it's not the fact that you've got a local forest, you grow some wood, you burn it locally, and then it's effectively kind of a net zero kind of thing. There still might be some implications. And, mm. and I, I suppose ultimately you're still burning stuff and releasing things out into the atmosphere. Yes. Which is going to take a long time for that carbon dioxide to maybe be reabsorbed by trees in the future. And you have similar pollutants to coal because it doesn't burn as, you know, when you burn, when you get smoke when you burn a fire, that smoke is things that aren't burning very efficiently. Okay. And it's, it creates particulates and things that aren't very nice in the air. Um, so biomass still has a, a net CO2 gain because the energy used to harvest all of the wood, to transport it, everything is, does use energy. Yeah. Um, but if you were to capture the carbon when you released it, it would be a negative carbon source. So you've grown a tree, you've burnt it, you've captured the carbon and put it underground and that's a carbon negative. So there is okay. there are ways to do that. But one of the issues with biomass is that when you look at um, land use, so when you look at amount of energy produced per square kilometer, you've got things like oil, gas, coal, nuclear, really low down, really low mm -hmm. footprint. And then you go up to something like solar, which is a little bit higher. Yeah. Then you've got wind and hydro. And then biomass is like, really high it's, it's off the scale for how much land you need okay. so when you talk about using biomass you've really got to think about the conflict between growing crops for food or growing crops for energy okay. and there's a big problem in the world we haven't got that much land we're using most of it uh, arguably we should have most of it returned to wildlife and mm -hmm. rewilding so how do you grow crops for everyone have wild nature and also a lot of biomass land so that is probably one of the big issues. That's a difficult thing to solve. Okay, so uh, you mentioned about solar and wind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's get, let's do wind first of all. Now, again, I've probably made some mistakes when I've been teaching. I said that you know wind costs a lot to install. It's going to be noisy. It's killing birds. Uh, some of the disadvantages, which are often uh, acceptable in mark schemes. Um, so, so yeah, a lot so, of those things were probably true when you were teaching them. Though the, the cost yeah. of wind has dropped. It, the, crazy. I mean, the, if you look back 10, 20 years time, what we thought it would cost now, yeah. all the predictions are wrong, not ambitious enough, the price has dropped really quickly, which is fantastic. So it's relatively inexpensive compared to other things? As a form of raw, how much power do I produce for this cost? Yes. Yeah. But when you talk about integrating it into a grid system, mm -hmm. so you're, like, like I mentioned before, you need to match supply and demand. The more um, intermittent renewables you have, like solar and wind, the more it costs to balance that. So if you've got 10, 20% of your grid with wind, it's easy. Yeah. If you've got about 50%, it starts to get a little bit challenging. If you're trying to get to 100, that cost is exponential. And there isn't really any credible um, modeling that shows how we can get to 100% renewables. That's why we kind of need dispatchable power like gas plants okay. or, or baseload power like hydro or nuclear. So you can't just have all of your grid run off wind. You need to have like a whole mix of different things. Okay, so um, killing birds, it does, does it, do, do birds fly into these massive turbines? Which sure, sure, some birds fly into it, but I mean, when you look at the numbers, I think cats kill 100 to 1,000 times more. Oh, really? Then the amount of birds that crash into glass windows, you know, it, it, it's one of these arguments that is completely rubbish. Uh, and I suspect, ultimately, if you didn't have some renewable fuels going forward, then the effect of climate change is going to be much worse on, on biodiversity than having a few things which you're trying exactly. to reduce. Exactly. Everything the we do has an impact, and it's figuring out the best balance to minimise those impacts while also being able to deliver the electricity that we all need. Yeah. And I think actually there's another downside, I think, for people who are very near to wind turbines, which isn't so much the noise, but it's like the flicker. Uh, in sunlight when the blade is kind of going across the ground. I guess if shadow. it's over your home, it's probably a little bit annoying. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's, again, that's, it can be, a, again, a, a relatively minor downside for a few people. But ultimately, if you're living that close to a wind turbine, then 
you probably have less impact than if you were living right next to a nuclear mm. power station or, or something like that. And as, as we as we talk today, onshore wind is still effectively banned in the UK for new build for new builds because of the planning permissions are very very difficult. Yeah, and that's something that they're hoping to change. But it's because of this. It's known as nimbyism. So not in my backyard. Yeah, and it's it's a big problem with large infrastructure or, or large important projects for the, for the nation. Everyone says we need wind, everyone says we need these things, but no one wants it in their backyard. Um, so it's, it's a real issue. And that's where offshore wind is really interesting. Yeah, so this is one of the upgrade cards you have in the game. Uh, talking about offshore wind, so this is wind turbines. So they, so, you know, I suppose being offshore means you're not having to build on land. Any other advantages to those kind of wind turbines? Yeah, so when you look at the wind turbines on land, sometimes you think, how do they build them there? Because yeah. the, the turbines are super long and they've got to go by road. Now, offshore wind, you can build them in a port and just ship them to the spot. So there's n there's not really okay. any limitation in size. So every every year they get bigger and bigger and bigger. I think now they're building 14 to 16 megawatt wind turbines. Yeah. And these are like enormous, yeah. enormous. I, I don't know what exactly the sizes are. Um, and the advantages of that are the higher up you go, the more wind there is. Mm -hmm. And over the sea, um, there's a what's the um, what's the is it the Reynolds? I can't the, the, there's a there's Maybe a, a physics there, some re yeah, Reynolds the, number and well, stuff like that. Well, it's yeah. something to do with the, the the roughness of a surface and how wind speeds drop. I should know that, but yeah, it's like a boundary <laughs> layer, isn't it, between like laminar and like turbulent flow. And that's all it. This, that's it. So over the that. sea, you have the, the least amount of um, slowdown of the wind, so it's more consistent, and so mm -hmm. it, it makes more sense to build wind yeah. there. And because you can build them as big as you want, you can go higher, you can build them bigger. And area is, so if you double the, the wind turbine length, I think you get four times more power. Yeah. So you start to really get some serious power. And and they are, they're massive, but often on shore, you don't really see them because I mean, when I've been down to Brighton before, and I'm sure some of you have been down there and you've, you see this amazing wind farm off the coast, but it's a long, long way away. It's, it's a lot further away than you think because mm -hmm. the wind turbines are just so massive. And there's a lot of evidence that they're actually a really, they're a positive effect on the ecosystems there. Okay. So they, there was, um, I saw this article where they've been tracking some seals mm -hmm. and they started going in this very strange grid-like pattern and they were right. wondering, well, why are they doing that? And they went to the location and realized that they were going from wind turbine to wind turbine and each place was created like a little reef and there was a lot of more life in those areas. Okay. So the seals had learned that and they'd been like kind of visiting all these different reefs. That's pretty cool. Mm. Talking of which, and, and the way that we can change nature, maybe sometimes for the better, uh, you've got nuclear. Um, mm. So this tends to be nuclear fission, which is, a, I suppose, a fairly well-established technology. Um, often there by the coast. And is it right that often like the, the, the water that's been through, and not nuclear radioactive water, but water that's been used for cooling go, is pumped out to sea and then it kind of warms the, the couple area of, nearby? A couple yeah. of degrees, yeah. So in the UK, you know, if we think about nuclear, we think about these huge cooling towers. Yeah. So that doesn't exist in the UK because um, we just put them by the sea. So the only point of the cooling towers is to turn the steam that you've generated back into water so you can put it back into the system. So it's not smoke coming out of those things, it's just... Like it's a just cloud. water, yeah, yeah, like a little cloud factory. That's it, yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, instead of doing that, we just use the sea. It's <laughs> it's the same principle, but it's just a little bit cheaper instead of building those enormous towers. <laughs> yeah. So so it can like pump out slightly warmer water, but I guess that can then maybe change the biodiversity nearby and like introduce different sorts. Or yeah. So different sorts of species to, to thrive. Down at down at Dungeness, so there's a power plant right on the coast, and uh, I, I worked there for a, for a while, and yeah. all the local fishermen. Where would they fish? Right by the outflow of the uh, plant, because the wa water was a couple of degrees more, and the fish would like it there, and there'd be loads of fish there. Fantastic. Uh, there's no radiation or anything like that, it's just slightly warmer. Yeah. Um, so, and this increase in temperature is a problem if you had a very small um, area that you're pumping this water mm -hmm. into, but into the sea, you know, it gets very quickly dissipated, and it makes no difference to, yeah. the, to the water temperature, but in that little spot, it's a little bit warmer. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then you've got a card for advanced nuclear. So mm -hmm. is this nuclear fusion that you're talking about? or? Yeah, so advanced nuclear is kind of a catch-all for future nuclear technology. So fusion yeah. is one of them. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what well, fusion is? I'm sure it'll be ready in 30 years' time. Or do you reckon it's going to be quicker than that? It's always now? 30 years. But what's really exciting about it now is that there's a real like push from private investment and lots of startups that are trying lots of different things. So okay. A little bit like the space industry. You know, If you look at 20, 30 years ago, it was something that only governments did, only the America, China, Russia, and it was very expensive and there was no money in it. Yeah. But now suddenly there's loads of startups, there's loads of commercial drive, and, and that's what really gets innovation going and, and, and things be, happening. Because they realise there could be a payoff. If you can... 
if you if you're a private company and you can get nuclear fusion working, mm-hmm. you know that you can make an absolute fortune in the future from that. Yeah, and it's taken a while to get to this point, but now there's a lot of money being pumped into it. But not just fusion, also advanced fission reactors. So okay. with novel fuels, novel outlets, temperatures, and the big thing about the the new fission ones is that the old ones you're talking about these giant buildings um, that take ten years to build and they're massive like really really big aren't they really big they make loads and loads of power but um, if you when you build such big things uh, there's always delays mm-hmm. there's always overruns there's bad weather there's there's things that you didn't expect with the ground etc yeah. with the new advanced nuclear a lot of it is built in factories so it's modular um, so what that means is I can create all the parts in my factory. I, I know the environment. I can control everything. So more like a production line of like, we're going to do this one and the next one's going to be yep. the same and the next one's going to be the same. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that's what happened with the jet engine as well. The, the first ever jet engines built took months to build mm-hmm. and now Rolls-Royce pumps them out in a day Yeah. Um, because it's this, it's this factory line. And what we can then do is just install it on site quite quickly. And But, but they're relatively small? Like in terms of size? There's this a huge range of ones. So there's some that fit in, everything fits inside um, a, a lorry. Okay. And it, and it does a couple of megawatts. So you can actually transport it without it needing to be built on site. So you mm-hmm. can make it somewhere. They can be used around the country. And a, a few weeks to set it up and, and, and generate electricity. So for example, there are a lot. some of those have been designed for very remote communities in, in Canada. Yeah. Where they rely on trucks uh, driving thousands of kilometres to bring some diesel to power their communities. Whereas these nuclear reactors, you drive them in, you put them down, and they generate electricity for the next 30 years. And are they a bit like, so you, if you have like a nuclear powered submarine, because you have submarines which are nuclear submarines which can carry nuclear armed missiles, but you also have nuclear powered submarines which might not carry nuclear missiles, because there's like a bit mm-hmm. of a difference between like the, the energy source to drive it forward and actually what it can fire towards the enemy. So a nuclear powered submarine has got like a small mini reactor exactly. is this kind of the same thing yeah so rolls royce who are currently developing a, an smr so that's a small modular reactor yeah to be deployed in the late 20s early 30s they designed all the nuclear subs for the military defense okay. so they know what they're doing they've been doing that for 60 years the first ones were in the 60s so it's basically commercializing that military technology and being like well actually we could be using this for generating clean electricity cool and i think one of the things with nuclear is that there are risks associated with it in terms of if it goes wrong, it can go badly wrong and mm-hmm. affect lots of people. There can be uh, risks due to, I suppose, the political situation, how it's managed. But in terms of like the carbon or CO2 emitted, how does that compare to other other kind of ways of generating electricity? Yeah, so if you, if you look at a graph of um, carbon emissions, right at the top you've got coal, which is mm-hmm. about 1,000 grams per megawatt. Yeah. About half of that you've got gas, so it's about 500. Um, and then biomass is another half maybe 200, something like that. And then all the other ones are really low. Okay. Um, so solar is actually about four times more carbon emitting than nuclear when you look at the whole life cycle. But they're all such small numbers that it doesn't really matter. Yeah. If you're talking about five grams per kilowatt hour or 20, as we're replacing coal, that's 1,000. Like, it's not a big yeah. deal. And, um, and so, so solar still has a CO2 emission. Yes. And it's not because it's burning anything. No, it's the... All the mining used mm-hmm. to, 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 to get the materials, all the energy going in to, to, to create the panels, and then the energy required to uh, decommission them. Yeah. So I think everything, like in life, there's going to be pros and cons. There, I mean, there's some really good things about coal. It, it just works. But there's like lots of downsides with it. And even the things which are renewable resources, there still will be some downsides, but they're going to be significantly less bad than the alternatives. Mm-hmm. And that then means that we can actually then start to look at how we can reduce the overall amount of CO2 emissions. And uh, you talked, you, you mentioned before about uh, carbon capture. Yeah. So I suppose when we talk about carbon, we mean CO2, don't we? Yeah. Um, so when you say capture, wh- what do we do with it once we've got that CO2? How do we how do we get it out of the atmosphere? Or what do we do once we've got it? Yeah, so a- again, there's lots of, lots of startups in this area trying to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so well, I think one of the common ways is to turn it into rock, essentially. Okay. Or, or pump it underground back where... So a lot of the... Where we've got gas mm-hmm. from, from these kind of like uh, gas fields, they, they're in d- deep below the ground, very deep down. There's these chambers that can kind of uh, where the gas is. Yeah. There's some ideas that once the gas is taken out, you just pump the CO2 back in yeah. and just kind of replace almost like for like. So there's gas there before. We've taken the gas out. We just put in a different type of gas. Yep. 
Okay. And other ones are reacting it so it turns into rock. Yeah. So you turn the CO2 into some kind of carbonate. Okay. And, and there's a few, there's a, there's a company, and, and, and in terms of how we remove it from the atmosphere, there's a various different ways. Mm -hmm. So personally, I like the most simple one is plant loads of trees. Um, yeah, it, work. it, it yeah. works pretty well and it has loads of other benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but you can draw it directly from the air. So okay. there's a company, I think he's called, they're called Climeworks, and they're based in Iceland. And they what, scrub the air for... Scrub the air, yeah. It's just, yeah. they have huge fans, they suck in air, and they've got some kind of catalyst or something that, that takes the CO2 out. Yeah. Um, the better way, is, or more, more effective way, which hasn't really been um, um, perfected yet, yeah. is actually, okay, you've got these gas plants and coal plants directly releasing highly concentrated CO2, Put some scrubbers in those in those tubes. Put some kind of chemical process that removes the CO2 before you ever release it. Yeah. It's a lot harder to um, in, in the air. CO2 percentage is 0 0.4, yeah. or 0 0.04. One of the very small. It's like the number of parts per million is like almost you can hardly see it. So if you, yeah. if you had a million particles and you looked at the parts of that which are carbon, it'd be very hard. To it's about 400 see. parts per million. Yeah. yeah. So. Imagine trying to remove carbon dioxide from 400 parts per million, or you've got this gas coming out, which is probably releasing, I don't know what the proportion is, but let's say 1,000 parts or 10,000 or 100,000 yeah. parts per million. It's, it's a lot easier. Yeah. But one of the problems there is that it's really hot. There's lots of other gases. It's a complicated kind of chemistry. Yeah. So that's what carbon capture is trying to, trying to solve at cool. the moment. And a couple more things. Uh, this is more about energy storage. So mm -hmm. especially if we're moving to more wind and solar, which I think are brilliant. And personally, I like seeing, sol seeing solar panels across fields. I think it's just a no lovely thing to see. Or seeing wind turbines in the hills. I think it's beautiful, you know, because it's of what it's doing. But obviously that's going to be temperamental. It's only if it's sunny or if it's windy. Mm -hmm. And if we could store some of that energy, um, you've got a couple of ways here. You've got pumped hydro and you've got grid batteries. So why don't we just get a load of rechargeable batteries and then just charge them all up in the daytime and then we can discharge them at night time? Yeah, so we can do that and we're trying to do that. Yeah. Um, the problem is uh, the cost, uh, the materials needed, yeah. and the, sort, the, the amount of energy that we're talking about storing. Okay. Um, because it's all very well and good storing an energy for, say, a couple of hours. Say you've had wind blowing during the day, mm -hmm. And then at six to seven, there's a big spike and you discharge batteries and, and, and support the grid in yeah. that way. The difference in the UK, at least, the difference between the amount of energy used in summer and the amount of energy used in winter is quite significant. And you're talking about terawatt hours, like huge amounts of energy that ideally you'd want to shift from summer to winter. So you're talking about we, we generate electricity in the summer or we... we have this energy that's in the summer mm -hmm. we want to keep it for four months and use it in the winter yes so what, okay. what but the problem with that is what happens then what happens well over the course of a year you're doing one charge cycle yeah so you're storing energy once and releasing it once yeah so over the course of a battery life maybe you're doing it 20 30 times mm. so the cost per amount of energy you've used is astronomical whereas the way these batteries at the moment is every day basically they're yeah. charged discharge charge discharge charge discharge so yeah. they pay back how okay. much they cost yeah so for the to be able to store energy in summer and release it in winter, you need costs to come down to I think it's something like a pound per megawatt hour, mm -hmm. and batteries are at best like a hundred. Okay. So the the sort of the scale you need to do that is enormous, and that's what you use. There are cheaper forms of energy storage. So the most common one in the world is pumped hydro. So what is pumped hydro? It's very simple. You've got uh, a big body of water down here. You've got a big body of water up here. You pump water up when energy is cheap and then you let it come down when energy is more expensive. So that sounds ideal because it's basically just using the gravitational potential energy, store the water, you, and that can sit there for six months, couldn't it? Yeah. You pump it up in the summer, it stays up there, then in the winter you let it down. There are losses, so it does evaporate. Yeah. Uh, I think on average you get about 70-80% of the energy you put in. And I suppose as well it depends on where you live because it's going to work if you're in Scotland, Probably not so good if you're in East Anglia or near London where no. there's not as many big hills. So the, the biggest one is in Wales in the UK. There's, oh, okay. there's, there's quite a large um, pumped hydro facility there. Yeah. And that's most of our energy storage. Oh, is it? And okay. so for, in the whole world, I think across all electricity grid level storage, 97% of it or something like that is pumped hydro. At the moment. In at the moment. At the moment. But and I think if batteries 
I think it's technology developed. I think the fact there's like you know electric cars. Obviously, there's a, a competition for the for the the actual elements and the minerals needed for making electric car batteries. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just going to drive technology forward, and there'll be alternatives which will be developed and and, and, and so on. So and car batteries will form part of the grid essentially. If you've got a million cars plugged in overnight, that's when you can use those batteries to to use the wind that we don't use at four in the morning. Yeah, because yeah. uh, electricity is pretty low. Um, so I think. There's so many aspects at play, there's so many things to consider, and it, it, I think it's a really interesting topic and something yeah. that we need lots of people working on. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you need to diversify. Um, you, you can't rely on one energy source. It, you'll always find an issue with that. So it's kind of, every country will have a different solution as yeah. well. So a country like Norway, they use loads of hydro, fantastic, mm. great. But a country like the UK, we're quite flat, so that's not the case, but we're quite windy. Yeah. So you need to do this analysis for different regions, different countries, different um, uh, priorities. So for example, if you're, if you're a developing country and maybe only 80% of the population have access to electricity, hmm. it's really important that you increase that access and maybe the environmental side is less important to you. Whereas if you're a very developed country, you're like, well, okay, how do we make our grid clean? Yeah. Um, so there's there's a lot of different uh, conflicting factors. Yeah, it sounds pretty complicated, but I think what is good is that technology does have a lot of the answers, and it's like um, it's not impossible. It's not something which cannot be achieved, but it takes like the political will. It takes, and I think this is happening more and more now, where people are talking about it, and I think that's something which is a really big development compared to twenty, thirty years ago, where people didn't think there are, there are any ways out of it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of good solutions there. Um, this game that you've got, uh, Megawatt, um, do you want to just briefly just say what it is? Yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's a card game that I developed alongside some colleagues, and uh, it just it's essentially challenges you to build an electricity grid. So it introduces all these different technologies and presents events and, and things that can happen to, to check whether your grid is resilient enough to mitigate against the factors that might happen. So there might be a heat wave, there might be a flood, there might be a carbon tax, and it's to kind of teaches the relationship between all these events and electricity because you, sometimes you don't realize that, for example, during a, a heat wave, um, your electricity demand increases because okay. people are turning on air conditioning, that kind of stuff. But wind speeds drop because during a heat wave, you've got a very, I think it's a very high pressure system, or very low, I can't remember. I can't remember, one. this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> during a heat wave, um, wind speeds are just dropped because the air is very stagnant and it heats mm. up a lot. So wind is very, kind of useless in those scenarios yeah um but so all these are sort of relationships between use and like supply and demand and weather is um really interesting and again why we need a diverse grid why we can't rely on one sort of one source of electricity fantastic so we made some videos you can see them uh, linked up here and there's going to be a link below if you want to find out about more uh, and how maybe you could use this in school uh, if you're a teacher or with uh, your friends and peers if either doing it in lessons or at home. But yeah, uh, thanks so much for coming in today. Um, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.